Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Pitaya Movie Channel. Today I bring to you a tale of a wealthy man's unbridled indulgence within a women's insane asylum. Miss Eugene of Affluence lives in a medieval noble family. From a young age, she was required to learn the etiquette of high society. An adventurous girl tightly locked by various behavioral norms, she becomes what the others believe a gentle and cultivated lady. Yet even so, her father Lawrence remains deeply dissatisfied with her. Eugene always feels like her father is a block of ice with not a shred of warmth to be found. But as so many years have passed, she has long grown accustomed to his indifference. For a long time, Eugene has had an almost open secret. That is her ability to see the presence of ghosts. But in the eyes of others, this is merely her side of the story. Her father Lawrence scoffs at this. However, as time goes on, things become increasingly eerie. One day while Eugene is out, she encounters a young man. Although he is not handsome, the book in his hands attracts Eugene's attention. Unable to resist, she takes a few more glances. This simple action catches the man's attention. He politely sits on the opposite side and hands her the book of spirituality. Of course, he has his ulterior motive. In his view, becoming a friend with a noble lady over a book is indeed a profitable deal. After they part ways, Eugene spends her days carefully studying the book. It makes her feel as if she has found a kindred spirit transcending time and space, and she becomes even more attached to the book. Within the family, everyone believes there is something mentally wrong with Eugene. They all keep their distance from her. Only her younger brother, John, believes his sister is not insane and is not lying. But his words carry little weight and cannot change Eugene's situation. Since acquiring the book, Eugene's peculiar abilities appear more frequently, making her increasingly anxious. One night, Eugene is combing her grandmother's hair as usual. She suddenly begins convulsing. Ignoring her grandmother's surprisingly gaze, she frantically opens the drawer and searches. In no time, she finds the necklace her grandmother lost over 40 years ago. It was the most precious gift given to her grandmother by her late grandfather. Eugene hands the necklace to her grandmother, who then slowly comes back to her senses from her sleepwalking state. Her grandmother is both shocked and overjoyed. She had always thought the necklace had been stolen by a former servant who could have imagined it had accidentally fallen into a crevice in the drawer long ago. Seeing Eugene return to normal, her grandmother curiously asks the reason, but the response leaves her grandmother more surprised. According to Eugene, she was able to find the necklace solely from the guidance of her grandfather's spirit. Soon, the incident spreads throughout the family. One with ulterior motives even embellished the story and informs the family head, Lawrence. This directly foreshadows the tough future that awaits Eugene. The next morning, with tears in eyes and a complex face, Eugene's mother wakes her from her sleep and tells her her father is taking her to meet another family for an arranged marriage and expects her to be well dressed up. Eugene obediently promises her mother she will behave well, although she doesn't like this arrangement. In the societal context of the time, girls don't really have a choice. The elegant carriage carries Eugene and her brother John on their way. During the journey, Mr. Lawrence sits in the front with a stern face, not uttering a single word. John stares at his feet with his tail down as if he already knows what is about to happen. Soon, Eugene realizes something amiss. The road before her isn't leading to an arranged meeting, but to the largest insane asylum in the area. She desperately pleads with her father not to send her there, insisting she is not ill, while Lawrence remains stone-faced. So Eugene turns her hopes to her brother. Yet John cannot speak a word either. Eugene is then taken by her father to the insane asylum. Though she shouts herself hoarse, trying to prove to everyone she meets that she is not ill, it is ultimately in vain. Eugene is forcibly dragged inside by the asylum staff, after an examination, she is taken to the ward by several nurses. Seeing no hope of escape, she decides to calm herself down first and begins to observe the unfamiliar place. In her view, the asylum covers a vast area with towering buildings that continue the grandiose Baroque style of the Middle Ages. Yet now these magnificent structures bring her an immense sense of oppression and endless fear. Moreover, she discovers that all the patients in the asylum are women. Before Eugene can think further, she is led into the ward by the staff. Being new here, she is quickly targeted by a madwoman. But luckily, a fellow patient named Louis comes to her rescue. Eugene then regains her composure from the shock. Louis greets her warmly, but in her eyes, the helpful Louis is not a normal girl either, for she dances wildly without a reason. Thinking of her future among the mad, Eugene can't help shedding few drops of tears. As night falls, the asylum's dining hall is brightly lit. In the noisy crowd, Eugene sits beside Louis eating dinner while listening to her introduce the patients around them. 
Not all the women living here are insane. A large part of them were sent here due to their reckless lives or after being violated. There are also many who were initially mentally sound but were tormented into madness in this place. In short, to survive safely, one must always pay attention to their own behavior. And so Eugene spends a nerve-wracking night. The next day, Eugene's only friend in the asylum, Louis, is invited to receive public treatment. But in fact, it's just a hypnotist trick to control people's minds under his manipulation. Louis, like a marionette, begins to make various strange movements. Then she falls to the ground, convulsing all over, looking extremely painful. The self-proclaimed gentlemen in the audience are impressed by the doctor's hypnotism, but turn a blind eye to the struggling girl on the ground. Soon after, the hypnotic performance ends. The doctor leaves with a faint smile. The audience as well exit, leaving Lewis still convulsing on the ground until she wakes up and is taken to the care room. Lewis's mood recovers quickly as if she's already used to what happened. At this moment, a young male doctor enters the room. He uses the excuse of treating Louis to send the head nurse away, and then he deceives Louis with sweet words to engage in some unspeakable acts with him. It seems that behind this asylum there are hidden secrets unknown to others. That morning, protagonist Eugene had the fortune to meet her attending physician. Although she spoke fluently, demonstrated clear logic, and fervently proved her sanity, the doctor seemed deaf to her words. Not only that he ordered the nurse to take her out furiously, Eugene lashed out at the nurse, which brings the attending physician more reason to suspect her mania. Thus, she experienced her first so-called treatment. The staff forcibly threw a completely disrobed Eugene into a specially designed bathtub. Immediately after, they poured a large bucket of cold water mixed with ice. The bone-chilling coldness made her tremble all over. All this seemed more like punishment. Soon after, a woman beside with purple lips from the cold completed the ice bucket ordeal. The woman hastily wrapped herself in a towel and walked out shivering. Eugene knew that at this moment no one could save her, and she had to silently endure the cruel reality. By the time she was dragged back to her room, she was already delirious from the cold. Fortunately, Lewis helped her feeling a bit better. Eugene knew she must escape as soon as possible, or else, over time, even a normal person would be driven mad. However, breaking out of the asylum was not a simple task. On the other side, Eugene's younger brother John worried about his sister. Though their father forbade him to visit, he still secretly entrusted the nurse with the Book of Spirituality, Eugene's favorite, to send it to her. The head nurse didn't immediately give the book to Eugene, but kept it for herself. That night, she read it by lamplight and quickly became engrossed in the book content. All along, the head nurse had an unfulfilled wish to see her deceased sister branding one more time. If Eugene truly possessed the ability to communicate with spirits, perhaps asking for her help could fulfill her wish. She spent a restless night thinking. The following day, the head nurse found Eugene doing laundry at the asylum, offering the book of spirituality as a trade. She hoped Eugene would help her see her sister. Stubborn Eugene didn't want to be at anyone's beck and call just for a book, but the head nurse made a more enticing offer. She would not only persuade the attending physician to change the treatment plan, but might also release Eugene when the time was right. Before Eugene could respond, the head nurse left without a word. In her view, no woman in the asylum could refuse the conditions she had just proposed. That night, the head nurse quietly woke Eugene and took her to a room. In order to regain her freedom, Eugene tried to search her mind for the spirit of the head nurse's sister, Branding. Time swiftly passed by. The sky gradually brightened. The head nurse was evidently impatient. She even considered the girl before her a thorough deceiver. Yet at that moment, Eugene began to tremble all over and called out the head nurse's sister's name directly. The head nurse looked astonished. Prior to this, Eugene had no knowledge of Branding's existence, yet she accurately uttered this name. It seemed she was not lying. The head nurse was about to inquire of her sister if there was anything she wished to convey, but Eugene, with a horrified expression, revealed the ghost informed her that the head nurse's father was bleeding at that very moment. Upon hearing this, the head nurse hastily abandoned Eugene and dashed home at top speed. The living room was empty. Her father was nowhere in sight. She started to blame herself for believing the words of a madwoman. However, in the next second, she froze. The dining table's napkin was stained with blood. Frantically, she rushed upstairs to find her father with a nosebleed, but otherwise unharmed. The father was astonished at his daughter's timely arrival and repeatedly inquired about the reason. Thus, she revealed the entire story unexpectedly. 
Her father flew into a rage, warning her to stay away from such mysterious matters. But only the head nurse knew for certain that Eugene had not lied. She could see a world invisible to ordinary people. On the other side, Eugene witnessed with her own eyes that her only friend Louis being left crippled by a group of well-dressed doctors. These doctors planned to perform on her a so-called bloodletting therapy Eugene with every ounce of strength, fiercely denounced the devilish actions of these hypocrites before her and declared her intent to expose the truth to the public. The doctors hurriedly brought a drugged handkerchief to subdue her. Upon regaining consciousness, she was taken by the doctors to an underground space separated by a lengthy corridor. She heard women cring for help from within. As it turned out, this was a solitary confinement cell designed to hold patients with violent tendencies. And so Eugene began her life in complete darkness. One day, the head nurse found Eugene once again. The two conversed through the cell door. Eugene told the head nurse that her sister Branding was well, and Branding hoped her sister would let go of her longing for her and wholeheartedly live her own life. The head nurse smiled in satisfaction. She reached through the food slot and shook hands with Eugene, as if reaching some kind of agreement. In the days that followed, the head nurse did her best to plead for Eugene, finally managing to bring her back to the hospital ward from the dungeon. In that moment, bathed in sunlight, Eugene felt the entire world was filled with warmth, but remaining within the asylum. Attaining true freedom would not be easy. Before long, the asylum ushered its annual charity masquerade ball. The women excitedly donned various dresses. They danced and frolicked, expressing their unrestrained joy. It seemed only in this moment could the gloomy and oppressive atmosphere of the past be swept away. Eugene did not compete with the women for clothing. Instead, she watched everything with a smile. Her happiness did not lie in the party itself that perhaps tonight she could leave this place forever. That evening, the wealthy arrived early at the ball. Following the director's generous speech, Patients dressed in bizarre attires were granted the opportunity to dance with the high society's philanthropists. Eugene seized this chance to reunite with her brother, John. The siblings cooperated with each other, weaving ceaselessly through the crowded dance floor. Before long, the nurse assigned to watch Eugene lost sight of her target, and with the help of the head nurse, Eugene and John disguised themselves preparing to escape the asylum. Meanwhile, a truly insane scene was only just beginning to unfold within the asylum. As it turned out, the so-called charity ball was merely a smokescreen. Its true purpose was to provide these wealthy individuals an opportunity to indulge their desires. Any woman of even slight beauty would be targeted. At best, they would be blatantly groped and at worst, directly violated. Under the cover of darkness, Eugene's group quietly slipped out the back door. A carriage was already waiting outside. At this point, the nurse tasked with tailing them gave chase. To cover Eugene's escape, the head nurse locked herself in without hesitation, and through the key outside, Eugene regained her freedom. But the head nurse, having let a patient escape, was captured and treated as a madwoman. In the days that followed, Eugene and the head nurse maintained a secret correspondence. In her letters, Eugene wrote as such, though I have gained freedom, this freedom is tainted with bitterness. The taste of your sacrifice lingers. I will carry your will and help more people. In this world of freedom, I have experienced unprecedented respect, my dear friend and hero. Though your body is confined within the asylum, my heart remains with you. The story ends here, the film, The Mad Women's Ball, released in 2021. Though it seemingly discusses ghosts and the supernaturals, it delves deep into the human psyche. In a world where right and wrong are indistinguishable, who are the real maniacs? As the ball of the mad beauties turns into a debauched playground for the wealthy, the answer becomes clear. The maniacs have finally obtained an opportunity to be on equal footing with the affluent, while at this time, the affluent shed their pretenses, becoming even more insane than the maniacs themselves. The overall setting of the asylum imposes a heavy, oppressive atmosphere. The myriad of treatment methods leaves the viewers in awe, a real-life hell on earth ultimately disguised as a gentle, sunlit charity organization. This is the director's most blatant critique of the ugly reality, as well as her alternative interpretation of the evil side in human nature. Well, that concludes this video. Thank you for your continued support. See you next time.